Okay, so how many of us have written some code in Python? Can you raise your hand? Okay, raise your other hand if you've written some machine learning code. Okay, so now since you've stretched and you've, let's get to the topic now, which is machine learning for sustainability. It's, it is going to be a very high level talk and I'm going to present some open problems. So it's the cutting edge, which we've been working on and some lessons from our previous work. This is an image of central Delhi taken at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. in the winter months. And you can very clearly see that there is some pollution in the air. The specific type of pollutant is particulate matter. And the sky looks very, very hazy. So this is just regular winter. So it's, it's like the end of the world. All the movies that show the end of the world, Delhi in winters is similar to that. It's a, it's a gas chamber. And sadly, air pollution is also leading to reduction in our lifespan. So the Indo-Gangetic plane that you see over here, sorry, not the Indo-Gangetic, the entire Gangetic basin that you see running starting from Delhi going till Bihar. So there people are living up to six years lesser than what they would have done if there was no air pollution. So this is by the WHO standard. So six years is a huge amount of life you're losing out. And there are other opportunities also which are being lost. So for example, United Airlines has, at least in November of 2017, they stopped flying to Delhi. So all those business meetings, all those important official announcements, everything had to get canceled. So they are very particular about their employees' health. Our governments, have, so our, we have not been so proactive thus far. So this is a pair of lungs, artificial lungs, installed in Delhi and similar ones were installed in Kanpur. So when they started, these were completely white. Within 10 days, they turned completely black. And these artificial lungs are fairly similar to, so they, they said that the color of the color change would be similar to how color change would happen for a regular lung. So just imagine all of this deposit in your lung. No, no wonder that your cognitive abilities will be affected, your physical abilities will be affected. So it's a huge problem. But what is the solution? So Bangalore recently had a very heated arguments about whether to install air purifiers or not. So how many of you think that air purifiers would solve the problem of air pollution? Yes, no, how many yes? Will, will air purifier solve the problem? If it doesn't solve the problem, why does, why do all these companies make a lot of money? Why, why is that happening? And people are buying, so I bought one in my home in Delhi also. Any thoughts? Sorry? Yeah. So this is a completely issue of the scale. At home, we are doing it to prevent ourselves from getting affected, but it's no way solving the problem. And that is why there was this heated discussion in Bangalore. So you're not cutting the source of pollution. You're only looking at the effects. And that you can never control in real life. Like you can only mitigate to a very small controlled environment, but not, doesn't make sense to install thousands of crores of these sensors or these air purifiers. How many of us know about the odd even solution which the Delhi government came up with? Now this was a very controversial kind of a solution for mitigating air pollution. There are some studies, one group of studies that show that it did make a positive impact in terms of the reduction in air pollution. There's another set of work which said that the reduction in air pollution, so they said that there is definitely a reduction in air pollution, but that reduction is comparable to the uncertainty in the modeling methods itself. So what that means is it's not at all clear if there was any help that this, this policy brought about. So one counterintuitive thing which, which happened was, this could have also led to an increase in pollution. Any thoughts why? Why would, this odd even policy lead to an increase in pollution. Any thoughts? So
So what people ended up doing was they didn't want to get inconvenienced. They started buying older cars, which were more inefficient, which would now lead to an increase in the particulate emission. So the policy was completely, so, so human beings always have this smart ability to work around the rules, play around the rules. So in essence, the solution is to cut the emissions. So on the left hand side, you see some um, thermal plant probably. And on the right hand side, you see the farmers. So the farmers are generally blamed for much of the, in, much of the gangetic plane uh, high level of pollution. So do you think they should be blamed? That's a simple question, either yes or no. So you, and this is the season where, where everyone tends to become, start to develop opinions. Because we're going to polls anyway soon. So do you think the farmers are doing something wrong? Why not? They are, they are causing pollution. So the, you know, the rich businessmen in Delhi are getting affected because of the farmers. So aren't the farmers doing injustice? So the first point to think is that farmers are living there itself. So if the bureaucrats or the rich businessmen sitting in the cities are getting affected, the farmers are much more affected. They are living, they're burning the farms itself. And another interesting thing, so the farmers said that they would rather pay penalty for crop burning. So the government tried to incentivize or penalize uh, farm burning. The government said that, you know, if you burn farms and we get to know, so we will put some penalties on you. The farmers said that it's still better, more economically viable for them to burn the farms so that they can quickly get rid of the current set of crops, produce the next set of crops. And so there are other very complicated policy decisions which are impacting these things. So the farmers don't want to be in the solution. So they're not the perpetrators themselves, they are also the victims. So we need to understand that so it's very easy to put to pass on the blame, but the overall solution still needs to encompass all the possible stakeholders. But we keep on talking about India. Let's talk about the US. So this is an image of Los Angeles in the 1970s. So it doesn't look clean to us, right? And Los Angeles or much of the US wasn't very clean in the 1970s. Something changed then. So they passed acts. They became very, very stringent about emissions, about regulations, and things are far better now in the US. So just to give some numbers, so I was staying some time back in, in a city called Charlottesville on closer to the, close to the east coast. The air quality index, there was three. And on the best of the best days, the air quality index in North India would be 70, 80, 100 or so. So people very often complain that, you know, India is, because of meteorological conditions, it's in a land where it's, let's say it's bound by Himalayas on one side, we don't have a lot of rain. So meteorology plays an important role. So, so if, you, if you ever had a chance to look at the pollution concentration over the year, you would see that the monsoon is the cleanest time because the rains just blow everything away. So that's also one of the reasons why Bombay, even though it has a lot of construction activities, it is probably not as polluted as a place like Delhi, which is completely locked from all the sides because the sea winds can blow some of the pollutants away. So this slide is basically telling us that there is meteorological conditions which impact, but they're not often in our control. Although China has been trying to do something by inducing false rains, artificial rains, so the emission is the one which we should be most focused on and concentration is the sum of these. So air pollution, now I'm going to slowly dive into a more computer science uh, view of the problem. So air pollution is a difficult problem because it can be very localized. So now this is showing us a map of Delhi again and these are four, 14, 15 odd air quality monitors. And the size of the bubble shows the pollution concentration in that particular region. Now, there is one particular place called Ayanagar. There is another Lodi Road. So these are separated by 20 kilometers. Would you expect the pollution concentration there to be correlated? 
Yes or no? Probably not, they're so far away. It turns out that the, so this was over a long period. If we see the correlation between the pollution concentration, which is time series data, it turns out to be 0 0.96, pretty big number. Let's look at two points now. So Anand Vihar is by the way, a pretty big bus terminal. It's, it's probably the most polluted part of Delhi and adjacent, adjacent to UP. So these points, these two points are separated by four kilometers. Would you expect them to be similar? You would expect them to be probably more closer than those two points separated by 20 kilometers. Turns out that the correlation between these two stations is 0 0.7. So, so you can see some, some very highly localized sources of pollution and some sources influenced by meteorological conditions which are going to be similar. So maybe the wind was blowing from this side to this side and that is why these two are fairly similar. And there are other various factors which are similar across these two points and very dissimilar across these two points. Or maybe there is a very high polluting source present at Anand Vihar. So it's a very localized problem which makes it very difficult to address. So what do we do? First thing we want to do is to monitor the air quality at a very fine grain level. We just saw from the previous slide that it can be very, very variable. So Maybe the solutions that you have for this place will be very different from the solutions you have for this place. It could be very different sources. It could be the meteorological conditions. So we want a very fine grained monitoring. The second thing which we want is source apportionment, which basically means that is it the thermal power plant which is causing the pollution in this particular point, lat long coordinates, is it the is it the construction activity? Is it the vehicular population, uh, pollution or what? So, and this can be highly variable across different parts of the country. So what is applicable for rural India will not be applicable for urban India. And once you do the source apportionment, can you figure out the most actionable set of sources? Not all of the sources will be actionable immediately. For example, if we figure out that the coal power plant is causing 70% of the pollution. Can we just phase everything out in a matter of months? Probably not. Not at the expense of our aspirations to become more developed. So it needs to be done in a very smart fashion, which also now brings in the interesting notion of energy pollution and the interconnect between these. Once we figured out some of the actionable sources, then we can develop some policies to incentivize those. And of course, we need to keep on educating. Uh, we need to keep on educating. So the current state of monitoring in India looks like this. There are about 77 sensors placed in the whole of India. Whereas the CPCB, which is a government body, suggests that 4,000 of these sensors should be installed. So the question I want to put forward to you, why don't we just install these sensors at all the 4,000 points in the country. Why would you not do that? So it seems like monitoring is an important problem and they've come up with an estimate that 4,000 sensors should be installed. Why not just go ahead and install? Sorry? Okay, it's cost. What do you think is the cost of, could be the cost of one such sensor? Any guess? Any wild guess? One crore? Any other guess? So it's roughly two crores. And it's not going to be easy to install these sensors. Beyond the cost, it's also, also a lot of other technical issues like calibration for these sensors, which make it very non-trivial to install and scale. Okay, so now a few open problems which have been solved, but we don't know if this is the best we can get. So the first is, let's say we get this map of air quality of day, which is we have these few monitoring stations. Using the data from these stations, can I estimate the air quality at all these unmonitored points. So this is now, you can think of it as spatial and temporal interpolation in, in one go. So you might have seen interpolation in one dimension. This is interpolation across time, time domain and the space domain and that's happening simultaneously. I'm not going to go into the details of any of these yet. In the second part, I'll introduce some of the details. The other important question, given that the cost of the sensor is fairly expensive, where do you want to install the next sensor? So intuitively, what do you think? 
you can install the next sensor. One could be that you install the sensors uniformly. Let's say you divide India into square grids and you install a sensor in each of those grids. So 4,000 divided by the area of India and, and you figure out where to install these sensors. But that's probably not the best approach. Or you could install sensors randomly or you could install sensors more in the states which are richer. The best approach is to install the sensor at the location which will increase the which will increase the overall prediction of the whole system. So this is one particular field, one subset of machine learning called active learning. Where do you install the next set of sensors? The third interesting thing is, can we fuse data across multiple modalities? So we saw the CPCB sensors, two crores each, but then there is some satellite data available. Now satellite data is free. So once NASA or some of the institutions have launch a satellite, you keep on getting that data. You don't have to pay for that as such. So, so there is one particular satellite from NASA which has an instrument called MODIS. So this measures the amount of sunlight which is reflected back. Now if the pollution is more in a particular region, so more of the sunlight gets reflected back. If the pollution is less, the sunlight reaches the earth. So this is one another reason why people living in polluted cities, they have a vitamin D deficiency because they're not getting proper sunlight. Even though they might be spending the same number of, so if you spend the same hours outside in let's say Delhi versus in a very clean city, you might have a different reception of, uh, of the sunlight. So one is the satellite data, the other is the CPCB installed sensors and the third is some low cost sensors. So these are often 20,000 rupees or so sensors. They're not going to be as accurate as CPCB, but can we still use these data? So we know that they're going to be uncertain, but in the cost of two crore, you could have so many of these sensors. There'll be uncertainty in them, but we're trying to reduce the uncertainty in them by having more of these. So another interesting view at this, of this slide is, CPCB will give you very high temporal data. So like this will give you 15 minute resolution data at the points where it is installed. But it's installed at only 77 locations in India, which means that spatial, spatial coverage is poor, but temporal coverage is very good. Whereas for satellites, so it passes once over India, but it scans through the whole of India. So it will give you very high spatial coverage, but very poor temporal coverage, just one reading a day. Whereas these are going to be uncertain, but they are very cheap and they can give you both high spatial and temporal coverage. So can we combine all of these parts? The fourth open problem is, can we measure the exposure for everyone? Not just the privileged class. So a very recent study came out that, so there is a class set of, uh, there's a class of people in the US who produce the maximum amount of pollution and there is a different class who end up consuming most of the pollution. So I'm not going to tell you what this class is, but if you have any idea about the politics and the history of the US, you might be able to figure out. So this is a person who is using the welding arc. So any idea what could be the amount of pollution generated by a welding arc compared to the nominal pollution levels that you would expect? So nominally you would expect the particulate emission to be let's say less than 25 microgram per meter cube. Forget about the units if you don't know. While welding is going on, this can shoot up to 1000. Now imagine the plight of all the construction workers who are not using these proper gas chamber masks. So they're going to be exposed to this very high level of pollution concentration. Are we talking about them? Are we talking about all the construction people who are continuously exposed to dust? which is high source of PM10 pollutants. So we're trying to do some studies where we're trying to measure the exposure for everyone. So the computer science problem here becomes that how can you create a small variable which can be, which everyone can wear just like an Apple watch so that you can get the exposure level of them throughout the day. There's another interesting work which has been done in the context of US and now it's also some of it has been done in the context of India. So can we use cars, install sensors on them, very cheap sensors, and get a view of the entire city? 
So for example, we are planning to do something similar for Gandhinagar Ahmedabad region. We put a sensor and that gives you now a complete spatial trace over the entire city. You don't have to go and install sensors at each different points in the lying lying in Ahmedabad Gandhinagar. You just get a simple trace. Okay, finishing off with air, I'm going to now come to the second theme which is water. Now, I don't know if you follow the news or not, but few months back there was this news that Shimla ran out of water. And the government very clearly said that no more tourists to Shimla for that particular point of time. Bangalore has been running out of water, many housing societies in northern India are very often running out of water. There are water tankers which come and they need to take water from them. And this is again, I'm talking mostly about the people who can raise the concerns. There are a lot of other people, maybe in rural India, who are not even, even raising their concerns yet. So this is telling you that 54% of India is under high amount of water stress. And so is Gujarat. Unfortunately, 51% of the water in cities like Bangalore, big cities, is unaccounted for which means that there is some wastage. So the amount of water you're putting into the system, you're only getting about 50% of that into the person's home, into different people's home. So, so the idea is can you install sensor networks and monitor the consumption at different points, the flow at different points, figure, figure out, out where the leakages are happening, figure out where the wastages are happening so that you can do an optimization. So this is how, again, I start always with the domain problem convert into a computer science optimization problem. So the holy grail in this line of work is can we create a very fine grained water breakdown. So for example, currently the wastage might be a very significant component. So here we have tried to attribute the water usage let us say in a campus. So some of it is baseline load which is always going to be used. There is going to be some use by the utilities. Maybe for air conditioning you require water. For other utilities, you require water. There is some of it getting wasted. And some of the usage of the water is directly related to weather. So for example, if it gets warmer, you require more water. That's also, also because the plants also require more water. There is more evaporation. So this is something which we want to build, this kind of a graph. Let's see what is required for building this. So like, like we did for air quality, let's just install sensors everywhere. So this is called a flow meter, which is an inline sensor. So you have to cut through the pipe, you put this sensor, and this sensor then reports the amount of water flowing in through it, in terms of the volume. Do you like these sensors? Do you think they are easy to install? No, right? So one, they're expensive. Secondly, they require the, the collaboration of a multi of a lot of people to get the sensor, to install the sensor, to maintain the sensors, to calibrate these sensors. So, so that makes it difficult. What we have currently been doing is we have been looking at some of the existing sensors which did not have communication interface in the campus itself. We opened them up, we added some, in, some interfaces for them which meant that we again went to some electronics 101. And the interesting thing which we found out was, so once we instrumented some of these sensors, let us just look at this flow versus time. Now if any of us have looked at the power consumption of any, any, any electric motor, you would realize it very quickly that this curve or this nature of this consumption is fairly similar. So this is flow of, of the particular flow meter. This looks exactly like the power consumption of electric motor. So what we are trying to do is can we use proxy sensors to measure the amount of flow flowing, flowing in a pipe. So instead of monitoring the pipe, can we monitor the electricity consumption of the pump which is pumping up the water. Now the electric meter does not cut through anything. It is at least one fifth the cost of the water meter. So here this brings the new exciting opportunity of building up this relationship between the electricity consumption and the water consumption. This, this, this can be a game changer, it can reduce the cost by cost and time by a long, by a big factor. The second problem is similar in context of active learning, where do you install the sensor? 
Now, in the water network, this is an interesting, it's a more interesting problem because this is following a very different hierarchy. So you have, let's say, a big tank at the top. Now, this feeds into different sub-tanks, then it feeds into different sub-tanks, and then it goes into the homes, then it goes into different bathrooms, into different faucets. So it's giving you some kind of a hierarchical representation. So where in this hierarchical representation can you install these sensors to maximize the coverage? So the goal is across this hierarchical representation, I want the consumption for each of the node. And so that's again a different application of active learning. Where do you install the particular sensor? Okay, now coming on to the final bit which is, is electricity. I don't, so this is a plot from 2009. This is showing the access to electricity. And this is again one of the hottest topics which comes up before the polls. So I was talking, I was talking to a colleague from a policy institute. So, and we were joking that the, so we were trying to understand the amount of electricity, uh, the electricity consumption just before the polls that typically we would expect it rises, increases. So more people get electricity just before the polls. And so if we want to ensure that we can provide electricity to everyone, we need to first understand where electricity is currently going. So buildings end up consuming the most amount of electricity for many of the countries. For example, in India, they consume about one third of the total energy consumption. So if we can reduce the consumption of buildings, we can effectively provide electricity to more people. So one such way of providing, uh, reducing the energy consumption of buildings is through feedback to the occupants. So you could build, like, you could build more energy efficient buildings, but most of the buildings which will exist for the next 30, 40, 50 years have already been built. You could replace all the appliances in buildings, but that is also very expensive. So the third thing is the human component. Can we incentivize the human to reduce the consumption itself, themselves. And the way we're trying to do this is to give them a feedback about the consumption. And we're giving them something known as an energy breakdown. So we're basically now telling them how much each appliance is consuming, instead of just telling them particular, you know, your bill was 500 rupees. Now, think of this in context of <coughs> a grocery store visit. So when you go to the grocery store, you come back, and let's say you're accountable to someone who told you to go and buy X, Y, Z things. So they look at the entire bill, right? They see that item A cost this. Instead of that, if you just saw a single number, that the total grocery bill was 5,000 rupees, you don't know where to optimize. You don't know how you can do better for the next time. And energy breakdown can help save you up to 15% energy. So this feedback, if it is given, that your AC consumed X, Y, Z, your fridge consumes X, Y, Z, so you can save up to 15%. So for example, if you have left, we have, there is no one in this room, and I figured out that the AC is on, I can tell that you, know, you should turn off the AC. So this started off in 2013 and 12 and 13 when I started off my PhD. So the easiest way to get an energy breakdown is to monitor sensor on each appliance, is to put a sensor in each appliance, right? So it's a power meter you put on each appliance, which measures how much energy is going through that meter. Now, so we installed a bunch of 60 odd sensors in someone's home in Delhi. Any idea whose home this would be? So, so this is the golden rule of PhD that it is the PhD student or the grad student who has to take up these initiatives. So the fun story was that I had convinced my parents that if I do this deployment, my PhD will be, will, will finish in three years or so. so. It took five and a half years, that's a different story. So this was installing much of these sensors in my home. Some of them were electricity meters for each appliance. So this was telling how much each AC is consuming, how much the electric iron, the geyser, laptop, air conditioner are using. We were not only collecting electricity data, but we were collecting electricity data at three different levels. So one is a smart meter. So smart meter is just like your regular meter but it can give you the real time energy consumption of your home. So you would have seen those in your regular analog meter, you would have seen that red LED beeping very quickly when you turn on the AC, right? Or that particular roller. So which in my childhood I used to call train is moving very fast, something like that. 
So smart meter will give you the reading. So you can attach a Raspberry Pi, get all the data. At the circuit level also, you could install some sensors to install, to measure how much consumption is there and also at the appliance level. So again, there are cert certain important research questions that at each level if you install, so at this level you get only the household aggregate, at this you get for a particular circuit. So each circuit could be catering to one room and this we are getting for a particular appliance. If you go down this route, it gets more expensive but you get more information. So what is the optimal point in between? But as it turns out that these deployments are not easy. So <coughs> homes can be hazardous environments. Hazardous in the sense that, let's say that if someone in my home becomes very motivated to clean the home, they might not value the 32 MB of data that I want to collect that day and they might just end up disconnecting or making one of the connections loose. I lose my data. So contrary to popular belief, houses can be hazardous environments for sensor networks. And aesthetics matter. So this is the beautiful night view that I had when I was sleeping. So you can see a bunch of LEDs. You can see some routers. You can see stuff. So clearly if the home occupant is not a PhD student who has some very clear incentive, you know, these deployments are not going to scale. No one wants them, these things in their homes. And interestingly, homes also have poor connectivity. So I was trying to monitor the energy consumption of one particular fridge. It turned out that one, that particular fridge was in a zone where the Wi-Fi coverage was very poor. So I ended up putting three different routers and I had to bridge them to ensure that I was getting connectivity across different parts of my home. And my network name was no network found. So. Okay, so there are a few interesting things which this residential deployment told us. So this is showing the voltage variation across US data set. So the their nominal voltage, voltage should be 120 volts. And we can see that varies from 119 to 121 volts. Let's look at the same picture from India. It should be 230, 220 volts. It was varying from 170 to 260. So at 170 volts, if I am running my AC without proper uh, stabilizer, so it might get damaged. Similarly at 260 volts. So 180 volts voltage was occurring typically in the night time where the load is a maximum because everyone is turning on their air conditioners and this is around 4 a.m. in the morning when most of the air conditioners have been turned off now. So what this teaches us, in the US if you want to monitor power, you just can measure the current. You don't need to measure the voltage. You can just assume it to be constant. In India you need to measure both the quantities which makes it even more complex now. You need to put additional circuitry for measuring voltage and current. So this particular uh, phase of my talk, I need to present some lessons from that particular line of work. So the first line, the first important lesson is to collect data if you can. So it gives you new insights, it highlights the challenges and if you live in that particular environment, you get to appreciate data sets a lot more. You understand why what you're getting. So you don't take everything just at the face value. Secondly, we move to something known as non-intrusive load monitoring. So this particular line of work began six years before I was born and even when into my final years of my PhD, if anyone would ask me what is the best work in this particular line of work, no one had a clue. So this particular line of work is we take the aggregate consumption, we apply machine learning, we break it down into different components. Why is this possible? Because you might see that each particular appliance has some unique signature. Like the air conditioner will turn on, turn off, the compressor turns on, off, it consumes high amount of power. For fridge, the compressor turns on, turns off, but it consumes much lesser amount of power. And fortunately for me at that time, the inverter ACs and inverter fridges weren't that common. They have now become very common. They are very, very difficult to model because they in real time can change the amount of, so they are basically like electronic components, like, like your laptop whose power can vary depending on the load. So they become very difficult to model. So you build models for each of the appliances, you use machine learning to basically deconvolve the signal. So think of it as a deconvolution operator, where this entire process is called non-intrusive load monitoring. Non-intrusive because there is no sensor installed within the home. 
you just, you just set up a smart meter outside the home and it is load monitoring. So since there was no existing work which would tell us which is the best NAELM algorithm, we built a tool toolkit around it. So our work was primarily around trying to make research more comparable. So it was a Python toolkit which we created and it was addressing three problems. So it was hard to assess generality at that point. So we provided common data sets. We provided 10 data sets in a common format, which makes it easier for anyone else to now use to enter into this research field. We provided baseline algorithms and we provided suite of accuracy metrics. So contrary to popular belief, I would, I would say, say that don't, don't, don't leave out engineering even in your research. So this tool, ended up being the most cited paper for me in my PhD. So more than 220 plus citations, multiple papers using this toolkit, which was much more satisfying that people are using the tool that you have developed and it won a few awards also. So the lesson two is that reproducibility and tools will go a long way. When you're looking at machine learning as a career or as a field of your research, don't, don't ignore the tools. Don't ignore the data that you're collecting. Okay, so, so we have thus far talked about gender and LELM, which is going to tell you a pie chart breakdown, right? That your ASC consumes 56 fridge, 11 light, 10 miscellaneous 22%. So let's say that you now know your fridge consumes 11%. So what? Can you do anything about it? You can pro probably do any something about it. And if you've probably seen the TV ad polycap cables, you might be able to try to do something about it, but what you need is something more actionable. So actionable LELM is, let's say this is home one, home two. You see that the home two has this high part state occurring much more times than home one. So this is, in this particular case, defrost happening for home two a lot more, which is probably suggesting that the defrost for home two is broken or the seal for the freezer is broken. Now, if I tell you that specific thing, they can get it fixed and they can move this 11 to 9%. But just by saying that this is 11% is not enough. So what we did was, <coughs> there's a bunch of work which said that, you know, providing energy breakdown is the goal. We said that that is not the goal, that is the means to the goal. The goal is to reduce the energy consumption. So what we said was, we, wanted to evaluate that, so one, you put a plug load monitor, you get the trace of each appliance. Now this is the best possible trace you can get for each appliance. Now you apply some of the techniques to, like the previous slide I showed, you apply some of the techniques to figure out how you can create some actionable insights to reduce the energy consumption. And you do it on the trace given by this ground truth sensors, I call it the ground truth sensor or the ground truth readings. You do the same when you apply NELM. So you get the household aggregate, you provide algorithms, you implement algorithms for breaking down into consumption of individual appliances. And then you provide the same set of algorithms to break this consumption down into defrost, energy or usage. And then you get the same set of feedback. So what turned out was, If we give feedback based on the ground truth trace, that is fairly accurate. This can help save up to 25% energy. But if you give feedback based on the traces you're getting from NIL, that is highly inaccurate. The red ones are the ones which should have been getting feedback. And everything in this blue and in this shaded zone should have been getting feedback. But it's completely getting swapped out. So what's happening is we are very good and <coughs> this field is about 30 years old. The field has progressed very well in minimizing the RMIC error. But has it worked, has it progressed enough to minimize the energy consumption? No, because it's been looking at artificial set of metrics, which have absolutely nothing to do with the domain. So the next set of lessons was that optimize for the right set of metrics, not for fuzzy machine learning metrics, which can get you another paper, but won't have any impact. Okay, so now since I'm between, I'm between lunch and you, so I'm just going to very quickly go through the last set of work. So we motivated 
this fact that you know NELM doesn't work very well it still requires a smart meter per home which how many homes have smart meters anyone here in our home has smart meter no right so typical smart meter would cost 10,000 unless the government or the utility is providing you I don't think anyone of us will be willing to spend that amount of money. <coughs> so we said that let's create this build in billion building challenge and there is no mention so, so this is not motivated by Flipkart I think they might have copied out just kidding. So the aim is to give energy breakdown for a billion buildings which is roughly the scale of all the buildings across the world and what we are going to use is just the monthly bills. So everyone gets monthly bills that is free of cost, no one has to install any sensor and there is some census data available, census data as in the number of occupants in the home, the area of the home, the uh, age of the home and such. So can we just use this information coupled with the fact that we will have some homes which we call as strain homes for which we can install the sensors. So let us say 0.1 percent of the homes we install sensors, 99.9 percent .9 of the homes we do not install the sensors and we try to complete this matrix. Now this is going to work because similar homes will have a similar per appliance usage. So the word similar is very important here. Let us look at two homes which have the same number of occupants. So since they have the same number of occupants they can have a fairly similar washing machine usage because washing machine usage is directly proportional to the number of people. Let us look at two different set of homes which have a very similar trend in the monthly usage. Let us say that in July it is 500 units, in January it is 100 units and the curve across the 12 months looks fairly similar. So what does this tell us? That they are very similar maybe in the air conditioner usage since the air conditioner is mostly dominating the electricity consumption especially in the summer months. So we similarly extend this notion and what we say is that let us say now you have January through December of one appliance, January through De December of another appliance and January through December of your bills. So bills is basically the sum of all the appliances and we have some of these readings available from the train homes. Now we want to fill out these remaining entries and for every test home, so test home is a home which just has the monthly bills and I want to estimate their appliance bills. I still have the monthly bills data and I still have the number of occupants and the area of the home similar amount of data. So we convert this into a non-negative matrix factorization. So again skipping all the details but this is a set of techniques which have been popularly used for movie recommendation. Okay, so using that particular set of techniques we found an interesting approach using which we can give an energy breakdown by installing sensors in let us say only 0.1 percent of the homes. So it seems fairly scalable right but the problem is let us say if I have some train homes in Delhi, I have some test homes in Gandhinagar, do they have the same consumption patterns? No right. So, so interestingly I see this every morning. So the morning temperature difference between Delhi and Gandhinagar is mostly 1 degree or 1.5 degree or 2 degree the daytime temperature difference is about 6 degrees. So we get much warmer in the daytime compared to Delhi. So the, the weather patterns are going to be different across different regions, the types of homes are going to be different, the type of people are going to be different, so different socio-economic cultural differences are going to lead to different energy consumptions per region. So if you want to truly scale energy breakdown across regions, one way is that we install, we have train homes in each of the regions but that is again expensive. So throughout the talk you would have seen that I am trying to minimize the number of sensors installed which is expensive. So what we are saying is can be different weather patterns, kinds of homes. So we are now going to look at another interesting technique called tensor factorization. So we have developed a custom technique said that assume that this is a three dimensional tensor, you have M homes, N appliances, T months. For the train homes you will have the data for the all these appliances, for the test home you will only have the monthly bills and this is the T dimension. So we are trying to break this down uh, this made this tensor as a product of three different tensors. One of them is the home factor which is telling you some intrinsic properties of home energy consumption. 
So this could be something like the area of the home, the number of the occupants. Then there is a season factor. So this is basically telling you that there are certain appliances like air conditioner, which depend on season. There are certain appliances like, let's say, electric iron, which are season independent. So you build this kind of two, so I call these terms as basis vectors, and you have an activation over these two bases. This is called the appliance factor. So the way we're trying to scale this uh, energy breakdown across regions is, we're saying that this appliance factor is independent across the different regions. So you don't need to relearn this appliance factor in a new test region. So what this means is if you go to a new test region, let's say if you had monitored homes, you had trained homes in Delhi, you want to predict for homes in Gandhinagar, you don't want to, you don't have to learn this factor, which means that you have to learn lesser number of parameters, which means that the amount of training required is reduced, which means that your approach is much more scalable. So the next lesson was to think about scale right from upfront when you're trying to solve a problem, machine learning problem. And this is also what like, Anirban was uh, telling about in this talk. And some of the other speakers have also mentioned like, that is why some, some of the times you end up with some approximate techniques. So thinking about scale right upfront helps you to identify the right set of assumptions. And the final two lessons are, so this is coming from my advisor who started his own company called Zenitex in Gurgaon. So they are not providing energy-based solutions to different verticals. So like they are providing energy-based solutions to Vodafone, Mother Dairy, Pizza Hut, Domino's Pizza, a lot of food in there. So what they're trying to tell you is, so many of the energy saving opportunities that they have identified are very simple. So for example, one of the strategies that they identified is, instead of starting air conditioning at 9.30 a.m., if we start air conditioning at 10 a.m., by the time the people come in your office, you'll still have the same amount of cooling. So you've saved half an hour of cooling requirement without having any discount on, without having to reduce the user comfort. So such things become possible if you do the monitoring, analysis of data, and then coming up with some insights. So this particular insight seems to be fairly obvious, right? Nothing complicated in it. So this was not deep residual connected GBM, uh, neural CNN with attention for reducing energy consumption, right? This was just trivial decision tree or just some if else kind of condition, if you can implement that. So to have impact in the field of machine learning, you don't necessarily have to make it very complicated. Finally, coming to the sixth lesson. So on the left-hand side, you see a blurred image. On the right-hand side, you see a high resolution image. So there's a lot of machine learning going on in this particular domain. This is called super resolution. You take as input low resolution image, you give as an output high resolution image. There is another field called image colorization. So you take a black and white image, you apply machine learning, you get a colored image. So our thought was, can we combine these two areas or two domains, use them in the context of our particular energy solutions. So what do we have? We have low dimensional energy time series data. So low dimensional energy time series data is your monthly electricity bills, which is only telling how much each appliance, or how much total was consumed in the previous month. Can we now break, convert it into high resolution time series data? So that is similar to super resolution. And can we convert so you, you get a single time series. Can you convert that into multiple channels? You have a single time, you have a single channel, black, white, you convert it into an RGB. So you combine these thoughts. Can you now get a high dimensional appliance, one energy, high dimensional appliance, two energy, high dimensional appliance, three energy. This is giving an energy breakdown. It's also doing it at a super resolution image. So think of it, you just need to get low dimensional energy data, which is very easily available. So the important learning from this particular line of work is, so you could borrow some learning or some newest happenings from some other context. So with that, I'll just summarize the six important lessons and I'll my, end my talk. So first, collect data if you can. It gives you a lot more insights, reproducibility and tools go a long way. 
optimize for the right metric and not metrics which just look good on paper, think about scale, that leads to newer solutions. Fourth, complex machine learning is not necessarily more impact. And six, feel free to follow learnings or ins take inspiration from other context. So I'll end by showing some of my collaborators. So all of this work is possible because of the hard work of a lot of people. And I've left a question mark in between, so that we can address after 2 p.m. Thank you.